Praise the Lord. Or I saw up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study. We thank you for the way you gather us together. Thank you for all those who are gathered in every place as we hear your word now. Lord, we pray that you speak your word very plainly and clearly and practically to every one of us in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that this word we're hearing today will bless our personal lives, will bless our husbands and our wives, will bless the fathers and the mothers and their children. And we pray it will bless the whole church in Jesus' name. We know the joy of learning from you is to rise up and receive the grace and do what you've called us to do. Therefore, Lord, we pray that the grace and the strength the determination, the decision to do what you're teaching us, grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. Let this word we study make a different impact, a definite impact in every life in Jesus' name. And for those who listen in the various locations all over this country and all over Africa and beyond, we pray, Lord, the same blessing you're giving unto us here, you will grant unto them in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to honor your word, respect your word, exalt your word, give our hearts to your word, and live to please you all our days. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you very much. You can sit down. Today we're looking at 1 Peter chapter 3. And we're looking at verses 1 through to 7. 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Likewise ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also be without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the air, and of wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel, but let it be the healing man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, Whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. In a passage that I've read to you, which we're studying today, you'll see the word of the Lord addressing the husband and the wife. That means the family now comes to focus. As we look at the word of God, you understand, as we've been studying the word of God together, we've studied about the individual newborn babes and the living stones in the temple of the Lord. And those of us who are Christians as individuals, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people. And then he has spoken to us as pilgrims and strangers, that as we are walking through this world and living our lives, that we live our lives as pilgrims. And then we have a focus which is in the future. We want to inherit that kingdom prepared for the children of God. And then he addresses us as servants. 
civil servants, workers in the marketplace, workers in the offices and corporations and workers in the various places where we're working. And then he tells us how we ought to live. We live our lives as those who are obedient to the Lord. Then he addresses the citizens in the country, in any nation, every nation where we are. And he says the citizens will be the king and we honor the king and we even fear him. And then he also tells us now, as we live our Christian lives, focusing on heaven and obeying the word of the Lord, our obedience and yieldedness of the Lord is not going to please everybody. Therefore, they're going to persecute us. And then he tells us in that suffering or persecution, we have Jesus Christ as a model, a perfect example. And he goes before us, he suffered, and he suffered without threatening. And without revenging, without retaliating, it says we should have the same mind and the same focus, and we should follow the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in this chapter 3, you see the first word there, likewise. Likewise, ye wives. And then verse 7, likewise, ye husbands. What's the implication of that word, likewise? Individual believers, here is how you are to live civil servants and servants in the places where you're where you're learning your work here is the way you are to live citizens in any nation any country here is the way you are to live likewise your husbands in the home the word of god has something for you and likewise your wives in the family in the home the word of god has something for you that's the implication of that word likewise and then he tells us in verse 1, if you look at that verse 1 again, that he is First Peter chapter 3 verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. There's a reason why he said that. There's a reason why the Holy Spirit is preserving this for us in the word of God. It says so that, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be one. That's the purpose. That if you have an unbelieving husband, so that by your lifestyle, by the demonstration of the grace of God in your life, and by the way you live, the way you relate with your husband, so that that unbelieving husband will be won by your conversation, your lifestyle, the conversation of the wives. The question then is, how can a believing wife win uh, unbelieving husband unto the Lord. Number one, submission to the husband. Look at verse one. Likewise, she wives be in subjection to your own husbands. The reason why that subjection is necessary. Number one, you're a child of God. Number two, here is the commandment of the Lord. Number three, it's to your advantage that submission is winsome. Submission attracts. But stubbornness repels. You see, if you submit to your husband, you want your husband to be born again, to come to know the Lord. Submission will make him to yield unto the Lord. That's the one thing you have to do. Number two, your conversation. Because it says that they also may be one. By the, uh, without the word, by the conversation of the wise. I know that that conversation is very broad, but I'm going to limit it. Number, and number one, this is number two now, conversational language, your speech. You see, the way you talk to your husband can win that husband, can attract that husband to the Lord. If you bully on your husband, you're going to repel him. If you nag your husband, you're going to repel him. If you are bossy on your husband, you're going to repel him. But if you have soft language, conversation that is attractive and winsome, a conversation that your husband will say, this man is very nice. The way she talks to me, the way she respects me, I like her language. I cannot find a replacement for this woman because I cannot find another woman to be soft and gentle and nice and you know, so respectful in language like this. By your conversation, you can win your husband to the Lord. Number three, it says in verse two, while they behold your chaste conversation couple with fear. While they behold your chaste conversation, this is your conduct now, this is your character, coupled with honor and respect. The fear here is not slavish fear. This is talking of just 
respecting your husband, loving your husband, honoring your husband. The way, you know, honoring is not, you know, I know that in many cultures in Africa, and this is not just in Nigeria, in many cultures in Africa, eh, there, is, uh, there is a bodily disposition, a bodily movement that shows that you respect somebody. And sometimes it's just to bend down a little. Sometimes it's to kneel down a little. And, and you know, women do that a lot in our culture. But, you know, it's not just the kneeling down. The kneeling down is good. When it's appropriate, sometimes it's not appropriate. When it's appropriate, it's all right. And it's just respect. Coupled with fear. But you know, the, the attitude, the disposition, the way you carry yourself, the way you even stand, sometimes your husband is talking to you and the way you approach him and the way you respond to him and the way you react to what he's saying can show whether you respect or you dishonor. And you know, there's a way you can look at somebody as, as to belittle him. There's a way you're looking at and, and it means, what are you saying? Who are you, by the way? Get out of my sight. You may not even say anything at all, but the look of the face and the attitude, the disposition may show whether they honor and the fear is there or not. How do you win your husband to the Lord? He tells us there, that's number three, your chase conversation coupled with fear. Number four, neat, moderate, conservative adornment. Neat, moderate, conservative adornment. Who's adorning? Let it not be that, out, that outward adorning or plating the air of wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel. You know, here it's not saying we shouldn't wear clothes. It's not saying we shouldn't keep ourselves neat. You have to keep yourself neat and smart and attractive to your husband. But he's saying that you make it moderate. Don't go to excess. That's what he's saying. And you know, there are some women who say they are Christians. They want to win their husbands to the Lord and they are shabby. And they don't look nice. And they don't even wash their, you see, the Bible says, not a plating of air. And that means uh, they will not wash their air for, I'm sorry to say, for about two or three months. And the husband is saying, what kind of woman is this? And, you know, the woman says, because I'm sanctified. You know, if you are sanctified, you can, be, you can afford to be dirty. Because, you know, sanctified people, we only think of the heart. And we're not thinking of, you know, washing our air and keeping ourselves neat. That's not going to win your husband to the Lord. That's going to repel him. That's going to save. That's what they are teaching in that church. I don't want to do anything with that church. We keep ourselves neat. And then we keep, we keep ourselves moderate and conservative. Number five, meek, humble, quiet spirit. Not noisy. Not lousy. Not disrespectful. Not screaming on your husband, not shouting on him. It says in verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. Number 6, is trust in God. Trust in God. You are not anxious, you are not worried. You, you're not making the subject of conversation every time because your husband is not coming to church with you. And then you disturb his peace every time, every moment. is church, 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 and Bible, and eternal life, and heaven, and hell. No, you trust in God. You pray for him, and then you leave him in the hand of God. Verse 5, for after this manner in old time, holy women also who trusted in God. And that's what's going to win the husband to the Lord. You are trusting in the Lord. It says in that same verse, five are done themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands. Number seven, you are doing well. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughter she are, as long as she do well. You do well. You keep on doing well in the family. That's what's going to attract the man. But you know, if you get angry, because the man is not born again, and because the man is not following me to church, and the man is not encouraging the children to be born again, all right, all the things I need to do, I will not do anymore. That's not going to win your husband to the Lord. Do well. Just do good. And keep on doing well so that that husband will come to know the Lord, will appreciate the grace of God in you, and that grace of God in you will attract him to want to know the Lord. On the other hand, how does a believing husband 
win an unbelieving wife unto the Lord. How do you win your unbelieving wife to the Lord? Come to verse 7. Likewise, your husbands dwell with them. Don't drive her out. Dwell together. Leave your father and your mother and cleave unto her. Don't be ashamed of her. And if she wants to follow you to church, wearing all her jewelry and all her lipsticks and all her pami and everything, stay with her. Come with her. That's your wife. And be, you know, be proud of her. This is your wife. Yes, yeah, she's not born again, but she's part of you. And when the wife sees that, that wife will be attracted to know the Lord. Because you are not ashamed of her, you dwell together. You live together. Number two, you live with her in verse seven, according to knowledge. Number one, according to the knowledge of the word of God. You dwell with her according to the knowledge of the word of God. If you are complaining about your wife, why don't you go back to the Bible? And see the women in the Bible. The wives in the Bible. Study about Eve. And you'll see the first woman. And you'll see what happened. And compare what she did to what your, what, what your wife has done. And then study about Moses. And look at his wife too. And see what the wife of Moses did. And compare that with what your wife have done, has done. That you're complaining about. And then study the wives of all the other people in the Bible. And then you'll see what really happened. And you'll see how they still live with their wives. And they still live according to the knowledge of the word of God. And it is when you are patient like that and you live together in the knowledge of the word of God that is when you are going to be able to win that woman to number three you live with her according to the knowledge of her peculiar needs we're different we're not the same the man is different from the woman the woman is different from the man and then you dwell with her according to her peculiar needs the knowledge of her peculiarities number four is giving honor giving honor you know you can withhold honor and you can give honor and you can act neutral to your wife as if you know she's just there you are not insulting her you are not abusing her you are not ill treating her you are not cruel to her you are just neutral that's not going to win anybody you know when you are neutral to somebody it's like you are not important it's like you are not significant. It's like, uh, you know, stay if you want to stay, leave if you want to leave. Give honor. Let the woman know that you really appreciate that, you know, she is your wife. And that, uh, you know, you are the husband. Number five, be considerate of her weakness. You find that in verse seven. As unto the weaker vessel, you deal with her. As unto the weaker vessel. And that means you know the areas of weakness. Sometimes it's physical weakness. Sometimes it's emotional weakness. And sometimes it's even spiritual weakness. Sometimes it's weakness in knowledge. You know, you discuss together and you are discussing at a very high level and you've lost her because she's not discussing at that high level. She is at a very low level. Come down to a level because you understand if you are going to win her. And if you're going to keep her to your side, you must deal with her according to her peculiar weakness. You are considered, number seven, recognize her heritage of grace. Grace is available to her too. The grace of salvation is available to her. And the grace of sanctification is available to her. And the grace of service is available to her. Because it says you are heirs together of the grace of life. All the grace available to you is available to her as well. Don't look down on her. That's how you are going to win that woman unto the Lord. And then avoid hindrances to prayer. Because what a mighty thing, powerful thing. When two of you shall agree as touching anything that you want on earth. And it shall be done for you of our Father who is in heaven. And then you want to avoid any hindrances to prayer. It says that your prayers be not hindered. We're looking at this uh, passage today and we're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, number one, the win, winsome conduct of a Christian wife at home. The winsome conduct of a wife at home. Number two, the wife's comportment towards the husband. The wife's comportment towards her husband. Number three, the wife's Christ-like character of the husband. We come to number one, winsome conduct 
of a Christian wife at home. We're coming back to First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, I'm reading to you from verse 1 and verse 2. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may be may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Here we find the word of God telling the wife, and this is a Christian wife. Who is a Christian, by the way? A Christian is somebody who has turned away from sin and has received Jesus Christ as his personal savior. And because of receiving Jesus as a personal savior, the grace of God has come to him. And that grace of God has changed his life, has turned him around. The Bible says, if any be, any man be in Christ, of course, any woman too. If anyone be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. If you married before you became a Christian, that is you, that is the sister, and you are a sister now, but the woman and the husband, you were unbelievers when you got married, and now you said you are born again. Your husband immediately should see from your outlook, from your language, from your disposition, from your conversation, from your lifestyle, from your attitude, from your emotion, from everything that happens to you, that something has happened. You are born again. That's a Christian, a Christian wife. That anybody living with you, anybody seeing you, that will say, the thing that used to bother you, they don't bother you anymore. And the things you used to nag about and complain about, you don't nag or complain about them anymore. And the attitude to the in-laws, that attitude has changed. Now you are welcoming. Now there is fellowship. You want those sin laws to see that there is something in Christ that has come to your life. And because of that, when they see your chase, conversation, your lifestyle, they will want to know the Lord as well. It's talking to the believing woman now. Now you are born again. Maybe your husband is not born again yet. Or maybe your husband is born again, but he's not coming to this church with you. Or maybe your husband is born again and coming to this church with you, but he's not as prayerful. He's not as zealous. He's not as committed. And he's not sanctified. That is, it's not that he's living in open sin, but you know that he needs something to be done in there, like the second work of grace. Are you going to win him to get deeper in the Lord and to get more zealous in the Lord, to get more prayerful? That's what the Lord is telling us. He's telling us that you who are Christian wives, you'll be in subjection to your own husbands in subjection to your own husbands. By the way, it's not just First Peter alone that says that. If you read in Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to see from verse 22, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the lord you know really we can this is uh, what submission there's no way we can escape submission for example you go to your place of work as a lady maybe you are the secretary there is a level of submission in your place of work as a secretary because your director your boss says please uh, go and work on this and bring it back at this particular time and you know that you're bringing that assignment that work back depend is very much important because other people are waiting on the line. We must submit this work so that the next person that will work on it will be able to work on it. And therefore you submit. You abandon every other thing and you do it. You have to submit. And sometimes it is like, you know, you, you are sick and you go to the doctor. And then the doctor says, here is the prescription and the medication you are going to take. And you have to submit. You have no choice. If you are going to get well, you have to submit. And sometimes you take your daughter or take your son to school. And, uh, you know, when, when you drop the son in the school, the school authorities will say, now, you want to come and visit your child here, your son, your daughter here. Here are the visiting hours. Don't come at any other time. And you have to submit. Submission is there in life. 
And if we can submit to the director, if we can submit to the doctor, if we can submit to the proprietor of his school, why not your husband? It's the same thing. Submission simply means you cannot have your own way. Well, the doctor, you cannot have your own way. It says you take these two pills and take it early in the morning after your meal, and then you take it in the evening after your meal, or it gives you all the specifications. You have to do that. There's no, there's no other way to eat. There's submission. And we do that readily. You know, sometimes you want to go out and there's trouble in the city. And they say, huh, there's coffee. That they gauge uh, that uh, nobody must go out after 6 o'clock. What do we do? You have some bunny things you have to do. And really, you wanted to do it at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the night. But now we have to submit. There's coffee. You cannot go out before 6 in the morning. You cannot go out after 6 in the evening. We submit. We submit to the government. If we submit in all areas of life, why is it so difficult to come back home? And then we cannot submit. And you know, sometimes when I look at the way people behave, we respect strangers, but we don't respect our husbands at home. And we honor strangers, we don't honor strangers, and we don't honor our husbands at home. And let's say, for example, a visitor comes to our home. See the way we serve the, the stranger, and the kind of plate we use, and the way we make the table, and the way we order everything, and the stranger will say, what a wonderful woman this is. Is. I, I have not eaten this kind of food. How many years have I eaten this now? We're very nice to strangers. Why don't we do the same thing to our people at home, to your husband at home? Does it mean that the nearer we are to one another, the less respect we have for one another, we can submit. In fact, when you submit to your husband, see what the Bible says. It says that it will make the husband, even if he was an unbeliever, it will draw him unto the Lord and will draw him unto you as well. You know, let's say this way. Number one, salvation attracts, sin repels. If you are saved, your salvation will attract your husband to you more and more. Because of the way you live now, because of the way you act now, because of the way you do things now, salvation attracts, sin repels. Number two, submission attracts, stubbornness repels. You watch in our homes and uh, you know sometimes maybe if the husband has been very, very firm on a particular point. And uh, even when the husband knows that he's very wrong, that you know this is the wrong stand you are taking as a man, but he says, no, I know this woman. If I bend, if I turn, if I yield, this woman is going to take advantage of my softness. Therefore, the husband will just be rigid like that. But, you know, if the woman also, if she's stubborn and stiff-necked and says, you know, I'll show you, uh, you know, you Africans who don't understand the marriage, but now it's 50-50, I'm not going to take nonsense from any man. If you are like that, the man is also going to remain rigid. But, you know, when you bend, you are the woman and you are the wife. And it says, ye wives, submit unto your own husbands. When you submit like that, submission attracts. Stubbornness repels. Number three, softness attracts. When you are soft with your husband. But sharpness repels. If you are sharp, sharp-tongued. And you lash on your tongue, on your husband. And you lash, you know, the children, you lash everybody. You don't even respect the father. That's your father-in-law or your mother-in-law. You lash everybody. That will repel everybody. They'll say, well, take your home. We can't come to your house anymore. Your wife doesn't want us to come. But you see, softness attracts. Sharpness repels. Number four, simplicity attracts. When you are simple, you are simple to deal with. And in a conversation, husband and wife, you know, there's no difficulty in taking decision because you are simple-hearted. Simplicity attracts, selfishness repels. When you say, yes, I've said what I wanted to say, that's where I stand. Why don't you consider this same idea? No, there's no consideration. That's the way you always do. I'm going to stand by my point. You know, that's going to repel the man because you are selfish. You're only thinking about your own side of the matter. Number five, spirituality attracts. Sorcery repels. If you get involved in secret cult, sorcery, witchcraft, 
that's going to repel that man. Number six, support attracts. When you support your husband, but self-centeredness repels. Then number seven, sanctification. Sanctification attracts. When you have a sanctified, saintly behavior, sanctified, saintly heart, sanctification attracts sharpness repels. And then we're told in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. We've read it in First Peter. We've read it in, in Ephesians. We've read it now in Colossians. Submit, it says, submit yourselves unto your husband, your own husband, as it is fit in the Lord. In Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 3. In Titus chapter 2 verse 3, the aged women likewise, that's a word again, likewise, has been talking to all the people, then he says, now aged women, you have, you have the word of God coming to you as well. That they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not giving to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach young women to be sober and to love their husbands and to love their children that they may teach the women the younger women to love their husbands and to love their children uh, by the way we have women ministry in our church and everybody knows that and um, I know we're doing well in, at the headquarters here, but you know, I'm not just teaching headquarters church. We're teaching the whole church all over the country in Nigeria and all over Africa and beyond Africa. You see, women ministry in the church is not for position. Women ministry in the church is not for competition. Women ministry in the church is not to say what the man can do, the woman can do. You have a great ministry. An important ministry, an essential ministry. And it says here yeah, that the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. As becometh holiness. What a great ministry that is. The ministry of being an example. Of living the Christian life with excellence. That the younger, the younger women, those who are getting converted and they are coming to the church... They will see you older women and they will see the love and the respect and the behavior of the Christian. You know, we cannot teach the whole Bible, the Christian practice and Christian dressing and Christian appearance and Christian apparel and Christian whatever. We cannot teach everything just in one month. But as these younger women come to the church and they see the behavior of the women, the elderly Christian women, then they will say, praise the Lord, I learned from that sister. These are the way to to behave and this is the way to act and then when we, we're doing follow up and we go to them and then they follow us to our homes and they see the way the Christian wife is relating with her husband it will teach them quite a lot and they tell us that an ounce of example is greater than a pound or a ton of theory. If you can just show them the example, then they will see how they ought to live their lives. Then it says, you will be teachers of good things. Teachers of good things. Now you understand the way women teach should be different from the way men teach. You see, when men teach, we men, you know, that we have our own kind of attitude, our own kind of posture, our own kind of standing, our own kind of commanding to own when we teach. But you, you, you women, you have to teach with example. For example, how do you teach a little baby? Have you noticed that it's only our wives, the mothers, that can teach those little babies how to talk? How to dress, how to say thank you when they give you something, how to share, how to help other people, how to put on this, how to put up that, how to make their bed, how to make their rooms neat. We men, the husbands, we cannot do that. Why can't we do that? Because our method of instruction will not be able to reach out to those babies and teach them properly. And you, but you know, sometimes we women will forget that that your method of teaching is very should be very different. It should be by example, 
by being salt, by being gentle, by being nice, by being holy, and by showing the example. That's how you teach. Then it says in verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands. We don't teach the women in the church against their husbands. Even when the women, when the husbands have done some naughty things, some bad things, some terrible things, we Christian women who are leaders, we don't teach those women to go back home and show that man. And let that man know that he has his place and you have your place. You can't teach women like that. You teach the women to love their husbands and to love their children. Are you going to teach uh, the women that if their children do something, not do something, but they should drive the child away from home? You cannot do that. You have to teach them to love their children. In the same way, you have to teach them to love their husbands. Even when those husbands have committed sin, you cannot teach those women that, you know, show that man. They don't don't give in to that man. Don't listen to that man. And don't, uh, you know, give your body to that man. If that man is doing that, then you should do something to him that will show him that he shouldn't have done that. You cannot teach that. You teach the women to love their husbands. And then it says in verse 5, to be district chairs, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. Obedient to their own husbands. That's submission. That the word of God be not blasphemed. That's what the Lord is uh, teaching us. And then we're told in, uh, in Proverbs chapter 14 verse 1. Proverbs chapter 14 we're reading from verse 1. Uh, this is talking about the ministry of the Christian woman. And this is to our own advantage. Every wise woman builds her house. Every wise woman builds her house. And you know that uh, we families, we go through many stages in life. And you need to understand, we thank God for families that are standing right. We thank God for families that are happy. We thank God for families that everything is going fine. And it is not difficult to build the home when everything is going fine. But my dear sister, the time you need wisdom is number one, when your husband is not a Christian. And then the in-laws are coming in. And the people are coming, brothers and sisters of the, on the husband's side, they are coming in. And then you are there, and you have to cook for almost six, seven people every day. And, and if you complain, if you drive those people away, if you say, I'm not a slave here, what do you think I am? That I'm just sitting down there cooking for everybody Pray that God will give you wisdom. If you want to say you are tired, there's a way you can say that everybody will sympathize with you. There's another way you will say that everybody will condemn you and say, what have you done? That you say you are tired. Just cooking for six people. My mother used to cook for 15 people. What have you done? You know, there's a way you can say it. If you want to say you are tired, that there's an attitude that you have the wisdom and Christ gives us the wisdom when we're born again so you can build your home. And you know, there are some trying times when your husband got himself into trouble. You see, sometimes our husbands are born again, but they get themselves in trouble by doing some naughty things. And the naughty thing the husband has done might affect you might make you unhappy and you know the, everybody you sometimes uh, you know the church might uh, even kick out your husband that's if the church is not reading the whole bible they're reading one page of the bible they leave all the other you know hundreds of pages but they kick him out and then the brothers and the sisters they said we had that you did this then they become negative and cynical and then your husband doesn't have any friend in the church and then outside is facing some difficulties challenges and places of in the place of work and you are the only one remaining to be able to comfort the man to be able to win the man back and to be able to make the man uh, get back on his feet again it takes wisdom at such a time because you are going through pain yourself because of what the man has done and yet for you to have the emotional stability and to be able to have the wisdom and the love and the appreciation for the man. Understanding what the man has done. Yes, maybe it is bad. It's just a single event. It's a single action. A single action of one day does not determine the whole of eternity. You can build up the man. You can raise up the man. You can help the man. It's going to take wisdom. And it's going to take the maturity of a Christian wife. 
And then when you stand with your husband at that time, when your husband gets over that problem, that husband will stand by you. That husband will remember, when I had no friend, this was the only one that stood with me. Look at that verse 1, verse chapter 14 again. Every wise woman buildeth her house. I pray will be wise. But the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. I pray the devil will not use you to destroy your own family. In Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. I'm reading from verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? I pray will be virtuous. For her price is above rubies. The heart of her husband is thus less trust, uh, simply trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Wonderful. You see, this is what we mean by a Christian wife. A Christian wife that will do him good all the days of his life. In the rainy season, in the dry season. In time of prosperity, in time of poverty. In the times when ch there are children in the family. All the times when there are no children yet in the family. And we're still praying for miracle babies to come. And I pray they will come. But you see, whether it is low or, or, or high. Whether it is time of poverty or time of prosperity. It says, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and walketh willingly with her hands. And she is like the Martians. Uh, she is like the Martians. She is. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth up. She riseth while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. I want you sisters, please uh, mark uh, that verse 15. Uh, you know, sometimes when, uh, in these days, when uh, the average uh, family that has a uh, little money, uh, you have uh, a wife, you have children, then you have accommodation, and then you have a maid. And sometimes the maid becomes uh, not really a wife, but all the duties of the wife, the maid is carrying everything out. And if the maid is not available and say, my dear, what are we going to eat this morning? Oh, it says the maid has not arrived. The maid is still coming, but I'm hungry now. Well, my husband and dear, when the maid comes, the maid will do my duty for me. That's not wise. That's not wise. You know, Christianity it makes us to read the whole Bible. And then you understand that this is your responsibility. If there is a maid, praise the Lord. But if uh, the maid is not available to do it, it is your duty. And uh, you know, sometimes the maid did not prepare the food well. Either there's too much salt or too much pepper or the water, the oil, everything is, uh, you know, apart. You know, these maids, they don't read any book about dieting. They don't read any book about balanced diet. They don't read any book about, you know, how to balance everything and make you healthy. It is the wife. What does the maid care? Whether you have cholesterol or whether you have hypertension or not, what does the maid care? Once he puts the food on the table, I've done my duty. It is the wife that is concerned for the life of the husband. Therefore, you are the one to intelligently find out what is it that will be a blessing to this man. This is Christianity. That's why you married the man. And therefore, you will not shift your responsibility on the maid. That's why it says in verse 15, She rises up also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. She guardeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by the night. Your candle will not go out. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her, her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow, that is of the cold for her household. For all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. And when he sitteth among the elders of the land, he make, she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth 
girdles unto the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in the time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom. She openeth her mouth with wisdom. She openeth her mouth with wisdom. And once again, look up, my dear sisters. Brothers, if you want, you can look up to you. If you don't want, just look anywhere you want to look. Sister, just look up. You know, sometimes we go to our places of work, and you know that uh, you know your job depends on the stability of that job depends on this man. And then he, she, he calls you. And you know this manager, this director, you know how they talk. And he says, what kind of work have you done? You don't understand that your staying here depends on me. If you do this kind of foolish work again, you're, you're, going to, you're playing with your job. I'll fire you. He that has the power to hire has the power to fire. And then you know that you cannot get angry. You know you cannot talk back to him because you know him. Because your job depends on him. Therefore, your smile, although the smile may be, you know, is your try. And then your smile, so I'm sorry, sir. I would do better. Let me go and do it. You, you are burning on this. You're unhappy on it. Why is this man talking to me like this? But you can't tell him. And you still put on his smile. And you still go back to do the work so that you will not lose your job. My sister, your home is greater than your job. If your husband loses his own self-control, that's not good, but sometimes it happens. He loses his own self-control, and then you, maybe you prepared food, and you did something, and a small thing. He shouldn't get angry, normally if he's a Christian, but unfortunately, he misbehaves and says, what have you done? Why have you done this? Remember, my dear sister, your boss said the same thing. You control yourself. Your boss misbehaved to you and disrespected you. You control yourself and you still smiled and you said, Oh, uh, boss, I'm sorry. I'll go and do it again. Please give me, give me 30 minutes, I'll be back. And then the boss, you know, he feels ashamed of himself that he got angry at. He says, this woman, this is a gentle, innocent woman. Why did I shout on her? He's already feeling guilty. And then you come back and, uh, you know, say, sir, I finished. I read through this time. I hope you'll not find any mistake there now because I tried my best. And the man is feeling guilty. He says, uh, you know, Miss so-and-so, Mrs. so-and-so, I'm sorry the way I said, oh, no, my, you, are my, you can't say anything. Uh, you are older. We younger people... We are just to submit. And that's why you keep your job. And then at the time of the recommendation for promotion, you are the first name. And the man says, there's a woman. I don't want to lose her. Please uh, promote her. If you do that, your director, with all that they say against you, why can't you do it at home? And just practice it at home. And when they misbehave, and unfortunately, they shouldn't, they shouldn't. But when they unfortunately do something they shouldn't have done, you say, I'm sorry, my dear. You know, I, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I, I made him. I'll go and do it again. Uh, 30 minutes and I'll be back and the food will be ready again. And I iron your clothes very well. I'm sorry I did this. You know, if we have that kind of language, our homes will be peaceful. It takes two to fight. One person alone cannot fight. The other one is shouting and bullying and saying, you can't do this here. When I married you, I thought I married somebody and I, I wanted a peaceful life. I wanted somebody to do this. You know, if you reply in a very simple way, I'm sorry, my husband, that I, you know, I did it like that. I wasn't thoughtful enough. I wasn't considerate enough. I'll go and do it again. The man will cool down. Am I right? So let's learn. In verse 26, she opened her mouth with wisdom. In her tongue is the law of kindness. We come to point number two. In point number two, we're looking at the wife's comportment towards the husband. The wife's comportment towards the husband. In First Peter chapter, uh, First Peter chapter three, First Peter chapter three, we're reading from verse three. Whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of plating the air and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. I'm sure you understand the passage you are reading here it doesn't say we shouldn't wear apparel. You see, there are some people, some Christians that have carried Christian dressing to a far extreme. 
In that far extreme, they don't, uh, you know, dress properly. Or they have a kind of, it's like they have a uniform. And all their dresses, let's say a Christian woman, for example, has about uh, 12, 15 dresses in the wardrobe. All those dresses are sewn exactly the same way. And then there's no, you know, they say there should be no style, there's nothing. I'm just a Christian. That's not what the Bible is saying. You can have different styles and still be moderate. You can still have different styles and still be conservative and not be showy. He's saying that it shouldn't be like the prostitute outside. It shouldn't be like the people outside that are just for dressing alone. What the apostle is telling us by the inspiration of the Spirit of God is that you are not concentrating on dressing as if dressing is the only thing in life. As if it's the main thing, the chief thing, the high thing. It's saying it should not just be that you are concentrating on the outward adornment of plating the air and also of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel. Where should be, where is the emphasis of the Christian woman? Here is the emphasis in verse 4. But let each be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. In 1 Timothy chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're looking at verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Reading from verse 9. It says in verse 9, like, in like manner also. This is the same as when it says likewise. In like manner also. I need to jump back to verse 8 because of those words in like manner also. He had been speaking to the men in verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without trust and doubting. Then it says, you see how men are to behave? Holiness, righteousness, no wrath, no anger, no violence. Don't you treat the weaker vessel? Don't you treat the women? Respect them and honor them. And then it says, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided air or gold or pearls or costly array. This uh, is more direct than what uh, the Apostle Peter wrote. In the case of Apostle Peter, I was just saying, don't concentrate on clothing. Don't concentrate on outward appearance. Concentrate on the inner man and have the quiet and then the peaceful meek spirit. Here is a direct scene that you are done yourself. This one says, adorn yourself in modest apparel. Make it moderate. What does it mean, moderate? Uh, Let's look up here for a moment. Look at society. When you say moderate, that word moderate is very close to the word middle. If you look at society, you will see some people very, very high on top. There is 20% on top. You will see some people 20% below. When you line up the whole of society, moderate means you are in the middle. You will not be at the extreme of fashion. You will not be at, you know, you'll not be the one that is a pace setter in fashion. That you are up there. And when people see you, they say, it's very, he has a high taste, which then tends to be worldly. Then if you look at society, the prostitutes and, you know, the women, the public women, you know how they dress. They're on the top over there. On the other hand, you have the people in the very low, very low level. You know, the people that, like the beggars outside, like the unclean people outside, like the people who are jobless outside. And they have only one cloth to wear and their cloth is torn. And, and you, when you see them, you know that it's the low class. When it says moderate, stay in the middle. Don't stay in the height of fashion. And don't also stay in the primitive old fashion that is outdated and outmoded. It says, be moderate. Therefore, you stay in the middle. When people see you then, they know that you are not in the top class, worldly people, high-minded people, conceited people, proud people. Neither are you in the low class as people that, you know, it's like you don't care about your appearance, you don't care about your look. You care about how you look and you care about your appearance. You are in the middle, you are moderate. Let's come back to this verse 9. In like manner also that women are done themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, 
not to embroidered ear. Again, you know, can you look up here? We're talking about the ear of the women now. You know that there are women. Again, look at society. If you line up society like this, you have people on the top there. And you see the way they carry their hairdo. It's like, you know, the hairdo is, is the only thing in their lives. And that is what they show all about. Well, the palming and the burning and, you know, the weaving and all this. On the other hand, you find the people who are very low. That is, the people who don't care about their hair. It's like, you know, they don't even worry to comb it or to wash it. And all the insects are there and they, all the lice are there. They don't care at all. That's the very low class. But you don't stay in the low class that they say... Why is this woman like this? Why is this she's not caring for herself? Why is it we're sitting near her? It's like her ear is, uh, you know, emitting some odor that is inconvenient. And although she's, you know, she's a real nice sister and a real nice uh, believer, but she's not taking care of her ear. It means when they look part of the percentage and then you should not go the other extreme and go very high at the higher percentage, but stay in the middle. And be nice and look nice and you know you take care of yourself. That's what the Lord is telling us, not to embroidered ear or gold or pearls or costly array. And but it says in verse 10, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. I pray the Lord will help us. Give me a good amen. amen. You women, I need your amen. amen. You are nice, nice sisters. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading verses 2 and 3. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love for bearing one another. Again, we come to enduring at home. You see, dear sisters, uh, there are things to endure at home. Uh, there are some idiosyncrasies. Uh, there are some things that men do that they are not even conscious of. Uh, you know, a man has been doing like that. He sits a particular way. He says, why is he sitting like that? That's the way he's been sitting since he was, uh, you know, in a primary school. And he's not conscious that there's anything wrong with it. And then when he's sitting, he's eating a particular I will say, why is he eating like this? And we're hearing the sound. And the people who are in the next door, they are hearing the sound of his mouth. They say, somebody's eating there. And then you are the wife. And you're feeling ashamed about the way this man is, you know, chewing the thing. And everybody is saying, that's the way he's been doing it from primary school. You need to be patient. You're telling him, but you're telling him in a nice way. There are some little, little things that your husband may do that at present just overlook. Don't just say anything about it. There are times to talk, there are times not to talk. At the time to talk, it will be a pleasant time, a nice time, a good time that nobody will mind. And he will, you, he will even make fun of himself if you say it at the right time. That's why it's saying, with all lowliness, when we deal with one another, when you relate with your husband, and meekness with long suffering and forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Unity is very important to you, my sister in your home. Therefore, endeavor to keep that unity in the bond of peace. I pray that our families will be peaceful in Jesus' name. Now we come to point number three, the wise Christ-like and the wise Christ-like character of the husband. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we're looking at verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge. We need to make an effort. If we make an effort, we'll arrive there. There's, no, there's nothing so difficult we cannot learn. If we know that, you know, in our family we've been having some difficulties, and then we check up ourselves, it is because the husband has not been dwelling with the wife according to knowledge, then let's learn. Recognize what the problem is. Recognize the part you are to play so that there will be peace in the family. Then it says, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. This takes practice. It takes practice. And you start in a very small way, giving honor unto the wife. It might just mean that you'll say, oh, you first, I'll take after you. Or it may be that, uh, you know, you want to do something. You know that she's tired now. I think I can, I can do this. Uh, and she says, no, that's my duty. I'll do it. You know, I know you are tired. You're, she can go and sleep. You know, in little, little things, you'll begin to practice. You'll be showing honor unto her as a weaker vessel. And then as being heirs together of the grace of life. 
that your prayers be not hindered. I'm looking at this word, husband. And this word, husband, it says, likewise, ye husbands, each is the head, the heart, and the hand. You see, we who are husbands, the husband is the head. I'm sure you know that. Is the head in Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading verse 23. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. But you know, Christ is the head of the church. But we don't feel inconvenient in the church because Christ is the head. He's, he doesn't act to us cruelly. He doesn't command us around in a very inconsiderate way. Now, as you are sitting down, are you feeling the weight of your head? Are you feeling the weight of your head? When you feel the pressure and the weight, there's a problem, go and see the doctor. But you know, even though the head is there and it's resting on the rest of the body, we don't feel the weight. It's not inconveniencing us. The husband is the head of the wife. But the wife is not going to feel the pressure and the weight and the tyranny or the cruelty. There's no cruelty in being the head. There's no tyranny in being the head. When we begin to feel the weight of the head, the weight of the man, I see this man is heavy. His language is heavy. His demand is heavy. His authority is heavy. There's something wrong. We need to go and visit the great physician. And when we are whole, and when we are all right, we'll not feel so much weight of that head anymore. It's not only that he is the head, he's also the heart. In Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. I'm reading from verse 11. Proverbs chapter 31. I'm reading from verse 11. It says, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her. You know, the, the husband is the head, it's also the heart, and it's also the hand. It's the hand. It's the hand that works, and the hand that provides, and the hand that makes things available for the wife, for the children, for the family. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 35. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. I have showed you in all things... House that's so laboring, ye ought to support the weak and, re and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Go back to verse 34. Yea, ye yourselves know that these sons have ministered unto my necessities and to them that are with me. The husband is the hand. Is a heart as well as a head is to minister to the necessities of the people that are in the family, the wife and the children. Husband, you is the umbrella. You see, the husband is a covering, is the umbrella in the family. You protect your wife from the rain of criticism. You protect your children, your family from the rain of uh, the oppression coming from your own parents, from the in-laws because the husband, you there is the umbrella. We're looking at uh, Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 16. Genesis 20, verse 16. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes. You are the umbrella as the husband. Do you, do you act as umbrella to your wife, to your children? Do you protect them? Or every bad thing they say about your wife, you repeat it. And then you, are the, you even add to what they are saying. But you must be the umbrella that is, uh, that is protecting them. As he is a shepherd in that family. The husband is a shepherd in that family. Already you know that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And the husband is supposed to love the wife as Christ loves the church. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it. He gave himself for the church as the good shepherd. John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Reading from verse 11. The good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. 
Therefore, as Christ has loved the church and he gave himself for the church, so the husband will be like Christ the shepherd and you'll give yourself for your husband. And uh, isn't, going to, isn't it a difficult question if I asked you, when last did you give something precious to your wife? Something that you yourself needed to keep your life. And you said, I'll give it to my, to my wife. I'll give it to her because I am a shepherd unto this wife. In verse 12, uh, he, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own sheep who, who sown the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. How much do you care for your wife? In verse 14, I'm the good shepherd, I know my sheep and I'm known of mine. B, in the, in the husband, that B means is the burden bearer. That means he's the builder. That means he's a bridge winner. The husband is a body bearer. The husband is a builder. The husband is a bridge winner. We're told in Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 1. In Romans chapter 15, looking at verse 1, it says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please ourselves. And that's what the husband ought to be considering every time. We are burden bearers. We are not to leave the woman to bear the burdens in the family. And we are not to leave the woman to just, uh, you know, be the one to do all the building, all the construction, all the uh, breadwinning in the family. We who are husbands ought to do something to be the burden bearer, the builder, the bridge builder, and the bridge winner. In first Timothy chapter 2 verse 8. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. The strong language. But the apostle made it so strong by the inspiration of the spirit so that we will know we are the breadwinners. It's wonderful when those uh, women are like the uh, woman of uh, Proverbs chapter 31 and they're doing something and then they're bringing something home. That's good and that's uh, commendable. But all the same, it is still the responsibility of uh, the husband to be the breadwinner and the burden bearer. A is for affection affection. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 we're looking at verse 8 So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because you are dear unto us. If your wife is dear to you it will not just be the word of the mouth. You'll be willing to impart not just material things, not just the gospel, not just buy a good Bible, not just uh, provide Christian literature, but you'll be willing to impart your very soul and the greatest need of, that you need yourself, you'll be able to give unto her. Uh, then end, you are the nourisher. The nourisher of the wife, of the children, of the family. In Ruth chapter 4, Verse 15, Ruth chapter 4, reading from verse 15. It tells us in Ruth chapter 4, verse 15, it says, And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age. And the situation here is that Naomi had lost the husband, and Ruth had also lost the husband. And Ruth came back with Naomi into the land of Israel, into Bethlehem, Judah. And then eventually Ruth got married, and Ruth delivered a son. And the neighbors came to Naomi and they said, you lost your husband. Your husband should have been to you a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of your old age. If your husband were with you, she should be the nourisher. But since she is not here, now this son shall replace your husband and it will be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of thy old age. The husband will nourish the wife, will nourish the children, will nourish the family. Ephesians chapter 5. 
Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 28. Ephesians 5, verse 28. It says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. How do you love your body? When you are sick, how do you care for your body? When you are hungry, how do you provide something for your body to eat? The same way you should care for your wife. It says, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it. Nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. D is a desire. You see, if, if we're really the people we ought to be, the kind of husband we ought to be, will be the desire in the heart of the wife. The desire of the wife and the desire of the family. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shall thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Therefore, the husband is the head and the heart and the hand. The husband is the umbrella to the wife and to the children, protecting them. The husband is the shepherd, taking care and giving himself fully to the needs of the wife. The husband is the body bearer, is the breadwinner, is the builder. The husband manifests affection to the wife and to the children. The husband is the nourisher and the husband is the desire of the children as well as the desire of the wife. The Lord is telling us by what we have studied today that we need to go back to the Lord in prayer and re-examine our lives and re-examine the demonstration of our Christian life in our home especially and of course in every other place likewise ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word they also may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives. Likewise, she husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers will be not hindered. I pray the Lord will grant us abundance of grace. And we'll have the grace to do what the Lord has taught us today. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has revealed quite a lot to us in his word. And if you are married already, the grace is there for you. Just, just, just stand on the grace of God. Wait on the Lord. And the Lord will strengthen you. You, for, you offended one another. Why don't you just forgive? That's the closest person to you. If you don't forgive her, if you don't forgive him, how are you going to enjoy your own personal life? Forgive him, forgive her. Overlook whatever has happened in the past. This is a new day. We can start again today. And you know, you can renew your marriage covenant and you can now promise one another we're going to live at peace. We're going to live with joy. We're going to live with happiness. We're going to be considerate of one another. You as a wife, how are you doing at home? You as a wife, how are you winning your husband? Are you winning your in-laws? Are you winning the people that are close to you in the family? Submission, very important. Your speech, your language, the way we use our tongue, wife to husband, husband to wife. There may be things we need to say we're sorry about. You tell the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. You feel really deeply sorry. We've not been very, very considerate enough the way we've been speaking to one another. Not respectful enough the way we've been speaking to one another. And we can apologize to our husband, you know. That will show honor, that will show respect. Even an unbelieving husband will be happy when the wife says, Sorry, I'm sorry I didn't consider that I was hurting you. The conversation, the speech, and the language. Then the chaste conversation, the conduct, and the character. The way we relate to our husbands. The way we behave to our husbands. 
neat appearance, take care of yourself, observe daily hygiene, spend time, spend time to be clean, to be neat, to be presentable, to be attractive to your husband. Be meek, be humble, have a quiet spirit. Not loud, lousy, screaming, bullying, shouting. And do well, trust in God. Whatever problems might be in the family, just trust in the Lord. And let the husband pray that God will give you wisdom to dwell with your wife. Stay with your wife. Live with your wife. Leave father and mother and cleave to your wife. Live with her according to the knowledge of the word of God. And live with her according to the knowledge of her peculiarities. Everybody has peculiarities. The husband may have his peculiarities. The wife may have her peculiarities. Live with her according to the knowledge of her peculiar needs. Give her honor. Let her know that you honor her. There's nothing to be ashamed about that. Our female teachers who taught us in school, we are not them. Nowadays, we even have some female women directors in our places of work. Bosses who are women in our places of work, we honor them. Shouldn't be that difficult to honor your wife. Be considerate of her being the weaker vessel. Don't tease her, torture her, taunt her, being a weaker vessel. Don't cause her more pain because of her physical weakness, emotional weakness, psychological weakness. Be considerate. Recognize her heritage of grace. Avoid anything in the family that will bring hindrance to your prayer. Let's make sure our salvation is real. The kind of salvation that sets us free from sin. Let's receive more of the grace of God to manifest submission. If, this, if there has been stubbornness, stiff neck, self-will, strong mind in the family, let's repent of that. Let there be submission in the family. Softness, not sharpness, Simplicity, not selfishness. Support, not self centeredness. Let's demonstrate real sanctification in our relationship together. Take care of your body as a woman. Take care of your dressing. Not worldly. And yet not dirty. You must be presentable. You're not like in the top high taste class. Neither are you in the low tasteless kind of appearance. You are in the middle, you are moderate. Let there be meekness. 
and let the older women, the more matured women, teach. Not like men teach. We are not competing. You teach with example. You teach with character. And you teach the younger women to love their husbands. To love their children. To love the Lord. To serve the Lord. And to live balanced lives. And we husbands, let's pray that the Lord will make us real head. But when you are a true head, the rest of the body will not feel the weight. We are not cruel. We are not imposing. We are not unduly authoritative. You are the heart as well. You feel for the wife, for the children, for the family. You are the hand providing for the family. Let's pray that God will make us like real umbrella protection to the wife, to the children, to the family. Protect your wife from the negative comments of in-laws and the rude behavior of your junior brothers and sisters, you protect your wife from those things. We should be the shepherd. We should be the burden bearer, the breadwinner, the bridge builder. Whenever there is any problem at home, it appears the woman is offended. And she is claiming she is right. You are claiming you are right. Somebody has to build the bridge of communication. Men, we are the builders. Bear the body. Show affection. Nourish that wife. Take care of that wife. That that wife will be happy. She is married to you. And you'll be the desire in the heart of that wife. Pray that this teaching will make your home better. Make you have more of the grace of God.